It is great to have you as we worship the Lord today. Thank you for joining us. If you're in the building or if you're online, we welcome you to Forest Lake Baptist Church. Let me make sure that you know that there are a couple of things to help you get ready for Christmas. Now, I know you're, you're trying to get ready for Christmas. Some of you hit all the stores on uh, Friday morning at 4 a.m. and stood in line to get that latest technology. I know you're all there. I, I was not, uh, but uh, I know we're doing shopping, trying to get ready for Christmas. So if you want to get in the Christmas mood, the Christmas spirit, come this afternoon at 2.30. We're going to be decking the halls. We're going to be decorating our worship center and helping us uh, get ready. And so we need some help doing that. 2.30 today in the worship center. As you exit today, there's a resource piece called a Family Advent Guide, and they'll be at the exits, and we'd love for you to get a copy of that. We all struggle sometimes knowing what to say or what to do to lead our families in Christmas and celebrating Christmas the way it should be celebrated. So pick up a copy of that. You say, well, I don't have children at home. Well, you may have grandchildren, or you may get together in a family gathering, and, and somebody turns to you and says, hey, would you, would you read some Bible verses, or would you pray about Christmas? That's a great resource for you, so pick up one of those on your way out today. We're starting a new series today on Christmas, the, the hope of Christmas, and I'm going to be preaching from the text that Donovan read a few moments ago in Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to be um, focusing on the hope that Christmas brings, or at least the hope that Christmas can bring into our lives. I read that Penn State does a uh, poll each year, and they call it the the Mood of the Nation poll. Last year, about this time, they did a poll, and what they found was that over half of Americans were extremely worried about the, the direction of our country and what's happening in our country. They're worried about politics, economy, inflation. They're worried about COVID-19. On and on the list went. But what the poll found was that 84% of Americans say they are extremely concerned, are very concerned, very worried is the term they use, about our country. Well, guess what? Isaiah was living in a time like that. He was an Old Testament prophet who lived during the 8th century B.C. He preached for 58 years. Can I get a witness on that? 58 years. And he watched kings come and he watched kings go. We know that he preached probably during the term of at least four different monarchs during his ministry, and these were tough times. These were difficult times. He watched the northern kingdom fall to Assyria in 722 B.C., and he's living in Judah, and he's preaching there, and he knows that the same thing's going to happen to Judah eventually. And so these were hard times. The land was full of fear. The land was full of anxiety. The land was full of worry. And then God spoke to him and gave him a message. He went into the temple to pray. Hey, that's a good place to go. Go into God's house. Go into the worship center to pray and seek God in desperate times. And as he did, God revealed himself to him. And then God began to show him something about the first Christmas that was ever going to happen when the Lord Jesus came and was born as a baby. That brings us to the passage that Donovan read I want to read it again, Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 2. It's on the back of your connection guide as well as on the screen. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You know what that is? That's a birth announcement for Jesus. You, you know what this is? It is the first Christmas card that was ever sent. That's what the book of Isaiah is. It is a declaration that God is going to send us a source of hope like we've never had before. And that's what Christmas is supposed to be all about. Folks, don't get lost in the fog of shopping and, and gathering and decorating and, and all those other things, even though they may be good in themselves. The, the, the purpose of Christmas is for us to celebrate Christ, Christ. 
And if you take Christ out of Christmas, you know what you have left. You just have a mess is what I say. <laughs> there's, there's nothing left. There's nothing left but holidays. Happy holidays, they say. Well, my goodness, that could mean anything to anybody around the world. We want to celebrate Christmas and put Christ in the center of Christmas. And so as we do that today, we're going to talk about the hope that Christ can bring to us as we celebrate his birth. The hope that it brought to Isaiah and to the Jews back in the 8th century B.C. And the hope that it can bring to us today. So because of Christmas, and here's the outline, when Jesus comes, he's going to be personal guide He's going to be our personal guide because he said when he comes, he will be wonderful counselor, wonderful counselor. Now, we all face struggles in our life. We find ourselves in circumstances where we, we wonder which way to go, which is the right way to go. There are so many choices before us. We wonder which choice is the right choice at times. And a choice can change your destiny. It really can. It can, ch it can change your destiny. I read about how Walt Disney was ruthless in cutting um, uh, parts out of movies and things like that that were designed for his company. And when it came to Snow White, that they spent hundreds and hundreds of hours designing a scene um, uh, where they would, um, I think it was cooked soup for Snow White. They, they cooked soup in the kitchen. It was a fiasco, of course, and it was funny. But at the end of it, Disney just cut it out because he said it didn't add to the storyline. It didn't help the story flow as well as it should. So we have to make choices. We have to make decisions. What decisions are you facing today? I've learned over the years in ministry that people are living in all kinds of different circumstances that I often know nothing about. I finish the sermon and they say, oh, Brother Donnie, thank you for preaching today. That hit me exactly where I was. Well, I didn't know anything about that. That was the Holy Spirit doing that. The Holy Spirit speaks truth into your life. And so as we come through these difficult circumstances of life, we struggle and we don't know what to do. Isaiah was like that. Isaiah was like that in times of political and economic and religious and personal turmoil He's wondering which way is the right way. And so God speaks to him and begins to show him the right way through the coming Christ. There was a guy that came to Jesus one day. It says in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, as he, Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now here's a guy that we should applaud because he sincerely, earnestly wants to know the right way to go so that he can go in it. Folks, we have a lot of people in our world that don't care about the right way. They just care about their way. They want, to, they want life their way, and they don't care what it costs you in order for them to get life their way. This guy was sincerely seeking the right way. He wanted to make sure that when life was over, that his life was truly successful. And so what does he do? He comes to Jesus and he asked Jesus for direction. That's a good thing. Come to Jesus and ask Jesus for direction. Ask him, how, how should I live my life? What should I do? He didn't know what to do, so he comes to Jesus. Jesus is the wisdom of the ages. Jesus really does have all the answers. Nobody else does, but Christ does. And so we should come to him. In John 21, verse 17 Peter confessed about Jesus, Lord, you know all things. Do you believe that? Jesus knows all things. And so what that means, if it doesn't mean anything else, it means that Jesus knows you. Jesus knows you. Jesus knows where you are, and Jesus knows who you are, and Jesus knows what you're going through, and he knows exactly how to guide your life and be your personal guide if you'll come to him and you'll ask him. He even said of himself in John 14, 6, that verse I love so much. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes unto the Father but through me. Jesus not only knows the right way to go, Jesus is the right way to go. And he will guide your life. I love the story about the boy who walked to the cemetery. And he's looking at the inscriptions on the headstones, which is, a hobby of mine. I like to do that. You know, preachers are weird anyway, but I like to look at inscriptions on the headstones. What do people write about you when you're gone? 
Or what do you want written about you? And so he read this inscription, which simply says, Stop there, you, as you go by. How about that? You weren't paying attention. I had all that planned <laughs> so that you would. Okay, you ready? Here it is. Here's the inscription he read. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Stop there, you, as you go by. As you are now, so once was I. But as I am, you soon will be. So prepare yourself to follow me. The little boy pulled out a crayon. He wrote this underneath. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> so which way are you going to win? Which way are you going to go when it's all said and done? Well, if you want to go the right way, you need to look to Jesus Christ. You need to look to the Lord because he's been there, done that. He knows exactly which way to go and how to help you go that way as well. So when Jesus comes, he is going to be personal guide. He is going to be wonderful counselor. When he comes, he is also going to reveal himself as powerful God, powerful God. When he comes, he'll not only be wonderful counselor, he will also be mighty God. He's not only the guide who can show you the right way, he is the one who can help you go the right way. He has the ability, he has the power to help you in, in ways that no one else can. Again, remember Isaiah's day, empires are falling all around him, nations are crumbling, kings are falling off their, their thrones. It's a day of instability. And so he's praying to God, he's seeking direction, and God reveals himself as a source of power. We live in a time where a phone call can alter the direction of your life. A news report can alter the direction of your life. When Hurricane Ian came on shore, the statisticians tell me that it was the worst hurricane that had hit Florida in almost a hundred years. A hundred years. Had waves that were 15 feet tall. It took the lives of 157 people and did over $50 billion in damage from Virginia all the way to Cuba. Your life can change almost in an instant. And when everything seems to be coming unglued, you need to be reminded that there is a God who's still on the throne, that God is still in control, that God is just as powerful as he's always been. You say, how are you sure of that, Pastor? I'm sure of that because he sent his son to be born as a baby in human form because of his love for us. And when Jesus came, he came full of the omnipotence of God because he was God. He is God. In Jesus' day, he spent a lot of time teaching his disciples, pointing them to have faith in himself and in his heavenly Father. And yet they just didn't get it a lot of times. They were just clueless, even as he displayed his power right in front of them. Imagine that, feeding the hungry stilling the storms of the Sea of Galilee, raising the dead. And yet they still didn't seem to understand who was in front of them. In John chapter 14, verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. That's the heart cry of men throughout the ages. Is, oh, if I could just connect with God, if I could just find the Lord in some way, in this mess of a life that I'm living, maybe he could help me. And so that's why we often pray when we get in trouble and we get beyond our own ability. Jesus responded to Philip in John 14, 9. He said, have I been so long with you? And yet you've not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? What was Jesus saying there? He was saying that whatever the Father can do, I can do. 
And whatever I can do, you can do because I'm going to live inside of you through your faith in me. And you can accomplish whatever it is that God calls you to be and whatever it is that God calls you to do. If you believe that, then when you read Matthew 24, 14, where Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus promised us that we could and would carry the message of the gospel to the whole world. And yet we wonder, how in the world is that possible? It seems such a colossal, gigantic task. It is because Christ is in us, the hope of glory, and can enable us to do all things through him. A retired pastor was near death, and his son was sitting beside him in those last hours, who was also a pastor, And the old man realized that it was Sunday morning. And he said to his boy, he said, son, you need to go to church and you need to go preach. He said, daddy, I just decided I would stay here with you today. He said, no, son. He said, you go on and you preach today. He said, if I'm gone, when you get back, you'll know where to find me. You'll know where to find me. Are your loved ones and your friends and your family going to know where to find you when this life is over? Jesus Christ is the one who can take you from this world and into the Father's presence. He and he alone has that power, that ability. You say, how do you know that? Because he was raised from the dead. He was crucified on the cross, and on the third day, the Bible says he was raised. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. That power that God exhibited The Father, through His Son, is available to us if we will trust in Him. Because of Christmas, Jesus is our personal guide. He's the wonderful counselor. Because of Christmas, Jesus is our powerful God. He is mighty God. But thirdly, He is also present friend. Oh, don't miss this. He is the present friend. When Christ comes and reveals Himself as He did 2,000 years ago, He reveals himself as the eternal father, the eternal father. Read the book of Isaiah. Isaiah witnessed the death of King Uzziah, and when he did, it troubled him. It rocked his world. And the scripture says he went into the temple, he went in to pray, and as he did, God revealed himself to him. Scholars have often wondered why he was so disturbed by the the death of Uzziah. Some have reflected that he was his first cousin, and a very close ally of the king. He had access to the royal court seemingly almost any time he wanted. And so when King Uzziah died, it troubled Isaiah. And God is beginning to teach him something about his faithfulness and his availability. He's not saying in this passage at all that God the Father and God the Son are the same being. He's not saying that. But he's saying something about the consistency of God, the availability of God. We know from Scripture that Jesus is the author of creation. He is the author of eternity. He holds forever in his hands. John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, which is Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says in verse 3, All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. You say, what does that mean? It means that Jesus was and is the eternal Son of God, that He created the universe in which we live, and He created us. He created mankind. He created us and put us in this world, that His life did not begin in the cradle. Don't you think for one moment that the life of Jesus started when He was born in Bethlehem and placed in that manger. It did not begin there. He is eternal as the Father and as the Holy Spirit is eternal. He just came and chose to live in this world as a baby, as a baby. John 1.14 puts it this way, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is so It's so far beyond my mind's ability to comprehend that God, who was infinite, chose to become finite in the body of a baby. Folks, that's what Christmas is about. 
that God chose to become a baby. He, be, he came in flesh. And that's why in Isaiah 7, 14, that, that Isaiah says, we will call him Emmanuel, Emmanuel, who is God with us. And so the lonely heart of man cries out for help. God, help me in this mess that I'm in. God, will you come and be with me during this trial in my life and throughout my life? We cry out for our companion and a close friend, for somebody who will never leave us and somebody who will never go away. Guess what? Jesus is that person. Jesus is that person. The psalmist said, if, if my mother and my father forsake me, if they turn away from me, then the Lord will take me up. God is always there. He's always there. As a matter of fact, he's here right now. Right now. One of our church members told me once that they were having Thanksgiving uh, around their table, and the little granddaughter was, uh, was called upon to pray for the Thanksgiving meal. And this is what she said, and I quote, God, we've got so many good things to eat here today. I sure do wish you were here. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Let me say that again. God, we've got so many good things to eat here today. I sure do wish you were here. The good news is that he's here. He's here. He's just a breath away. He's just faith away. If you'll call upon him, he will save you. He will forgive you. He will make you his forever and ever. He will be your present friend. When Jesus comes, he'll come as personal guide, as powerful God, as present friend. But lastly, Jesus, when he comes and reveals himself will be peace, peace. He'll be the prince of peace, Isaiah said. You know, the ancient Jewish bidding is shalom, shalom, which is translated peace, which means peace in your body, peace in your relationships, peace in your emotions, uh, peace in your spirit. It, it, it's, it's a wonderful way of greeting a fellow Jew and wishing the best for them. When God the Father sent his only son, he sent him to give peace. Peace to a troubled world. Peace to the troubled heart. The angels declared about him in Luke chapter 2 and verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. I tell you, our world needs peace. Our world needs peace. Our world needs a way to resolve its differences in a nonviolent way. I'll never forget one of the times that Charlotte and I were in Israel on a tour bus. They always have an Israeli tour guide there, um, extremely capable and knowledgeable about the land and what happened in it so many years ago. And this guy that was our tour guide was... He was buffed and muscled up, and he was ex-military. He'd, he'd retired from the military and um, just didn't seem very approachable at all. But toward the end of our tour of Jerusalem, as we looked out over the city, tears came into his eyes, and he asked us as a group, he said, would you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I mean, we, we were shocked. But that's, what it, that's what's on his heart. Our world needs peace. We need peace among the nations, and we pray for it, and we sing songs about it, and we even vote for it, hoping that some politician will bring it in, but there, none of them seem to satisfy. There is no program. There is no plan. There is no platform that will ever bring peace because peace comes in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. You say, I'd, I'd love for the nations to have peace, Brother Donnie, but honestly, I'm, I'm more concerned about peace in my own relationships right now. We just got turmoil and trouble in our family or among friends or people I work with. Let me tell you something. The key to relational peace is spiritual peace. To have peace in your spirit with Christ first, and then Christ can enable you and help you to have peace with those around you. Jesus wants to bring us peace. Paul was burdened about those people in his day that didn't know Jesus, didn't know peace. 
He wrote about them in Romans 3.17. He said, the path of peace they have not known. And there's so many in our world that they've never known the path of peace. They've never known it. Their life is full of chaos and confusion. Oh, they wouldn't admit that to you, but they know it's true. Of questioning and wondering and doubt and fear and worry about what's going to happen to them or perhaps what will happen to their family. And it just consumes them. But there is a peace that passes understanding. You say, that's just preacher talk. No, it's not. I've been there. I've, been, I've experienced it on more than one occasion. There's a peace of God that can flood your soul and overwhelm you. And you can't describe it. You can't explain it, much less describe it. There's a peace of God that Jesus can bring into your life if you'll let him. Fulton Ausler said, We crucify ourselves between two thieves, regret for yesterday and fear of tomorrow. That's a wise statement. We live so often in the balance, worrying about what we should have done or, or worrying about what might happen to us, that we lose the precious time that God has given us today. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul said, The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you have it? Do you have the peace of God that passes all understanding? If you don't, you can. You can have that peace today through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him. I like what Cornell West once said. He said, as a Christian, I am a prisoner of hope. <laughs> I am a prisoner of hope. As a believer in Jesus, no matter what happens to me or what happens around me or in me, I just can't get away from the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. He's always there. He's exactly what I need. He's pointing the direction. He is my peace. Because of Christmas, you can have that too. You can have the hope that Christ can bring. And Christ can be your personal guide. He can be your powerful God. He can be your personal friend. He can be your peace. But you have to trust in him. Would you bow your head with me and close your eyes? And as we pray, I'm going to ask you to consider turning your heart toward Jesus Christ and trusting in him. Not as the baby who was born, but as the, the God man who went to the cross and died to pay for your sins and then rose from the grave to prove that he is God. Would you call upon him and believe in him even now? Fathers, we pray in these moments, draw our hearts toward you to trust not in ourselves and not in our world and not in our circumstances, but to trust in Christ, to trust in Jesus, the one that Isaiah saw coming and the one that came and the one that we look back on now in faith. Draw us to a full devotion to you, Lord Jesus. Change our lives. Deliver us. Make us your children. Set us free to serve you and your kingdom in this world. God, help us to celebrate Christmas this year in a way that would honor the Christ of Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.